Welcome to our Train the Trainer webinar for Project Phoenix 2.0, The Recovery. This webinar is presented by the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council with support by the U.S. Economic Development Administration. My name is Sarah Vitale and I'm a senior planner at the TBRPC. This morning I will serve as the moderator for today's webinar. A few notes of housekeeping before we get started. At the bottom of your screen, you should see three important buttons, the chat, the raise hand, and the Q&A buttons. So if you experience any technical difficulties, please send me a message using the chat button, or if you prefer email, you can write to marsh at tbrpc.org. Uh, please let us know and we'll try to help you through any technical issues. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website to accompany the training materials. And there are two ways to ask a question. The first way is to click the raise hand button and I will unmute you during the Q&A period so you can ask your question. The second way is to type your question into the Q&A window. So you can do this at any point in time throughout the webinar. And when we get to a Q&A period, I will pose those questions to our presenters. This is a really important note. If you have trouble hearing the videos that will be playing in a little while, please take a look at this part of your screen. It's the view options panel and make sure that the mute Sarah Vitale shared sound is not checked. So if it looks like this on your computer, you shouldn't have any trouble hearing the videos. But throughout the webinar, if you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat button and let us know. Now on to our, our program. Since 1962, the TBRPC has created a setting for regional communication, coordination, and collaboration. Our programs and services span a broad range of planning topics, including economics, emergency management, the environment, and resiliency. The TBRPC created Project Phoenix in 2009 to simulate the effects of a worst case hurricane scenario in our region, a direct strike from a category five hurricane. This year, we've updated the original Phoenix scenario and now proudly present Project Phoenix 2.0, The Recovery, a training exercise that focuses on small businesses and their short and long-term recovery after a major disaster. I'd like to thank our stakeholder committee who helped us to develop Project Phoenix 2.0 over the last several months. Thank you to the emergency management staff and small business partners who participated in our meetings. And originally, we had planned to host a big uh, Project Phoenix tabletop exercise at the start of hurricane season. We had a great venue selected. We were going to invite over 100 people, but of course the pandemic happened, so we had to make a change to those plans. And as we were developing the project, it became clear that our stakeholders, the emergency managers specifically, were very interested in exercise materials that they could easily pick up and adapt for their needs. So when the pandemic began, we asked our project team to create training materials that our stakeholders could use to conduct their own hurricane exercises throughout the region and long into the future. Today's Train the Trainer webinar will introduce you to all of the materials that were developed to support the Project Phoenix 2.0 update. This includes our new Phoenix video that helps to set the scene for a training exercise. These resources are designed to be easily customized for your specific audience and goals and for a variety of in-person or even virtual training events. Our project team out of Tallahassee, Florida includes Critical Integrated Solutions, Inc., our exercise and training leaders, Madison Street Strategies, our business recovery experts, and Frame, a team of award-winning filmmakers. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to our team to introduce us to the training materials. I see some familiar names and, and welcome. Uh, I'm Ben St. John, president of Critical Integrative Solutions and Project Phoenix Project Manager. I'm a service disabled, veteran owned small business, and I understand small business. I've been a first responder, emergency manager, and member of the State Emergency Operations Center. I know preparedness, response, and the challenges of recovery. <clears throat> As a master exercise practitioner and FEMA practitioner instructor, I've been conducting exercises and training since 1988, including multiple statewide 
in multi-jurisdictional exercises for the Florida Department of Health and other locations. So I know a little bit about exercises. My goal is to translate this team's knowledge and experience into something that will allow you to build resiliency in your communities. Next up, longtime colleague, Mr. Michael Beha. Um, I would just like to, to, uh, to uh, say I, I have lots of experience. Uh, most of that comes from, uh, from being, being the, the, the director, the lead planner, or the controller of the statewide hurricane exercise. I'm a, uh, a, a master exercise uh, practitioner, um, and I've been involved in lots of exercises around the state. The, the, the thing that I'm most proud of, though, in this exercise is that um, I think I, I, I have a local knowledge, and I'm really uh, proud of, of how we have uh, uh, have added a lot of uh, local uh, detail to make your exercise uh, more uh, uh, meaningful for, for you. And next up uh, is a business consultant, uh, is, is Aaron Gillespie. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Erin Gillespie. I'm also a small business entrepreneur now with Madison Street Strategies. Um, previous to that, I had 11 years in state government, um, mostly focused in crisis communications and then in disaster recovery. Um, so I was the ESF 18 lead um, for business preparation, response and recovery operations at the state EOC. For the past four years during the hurricanes, Hermie Matthew, Irma and Michael along with several other um, disasters that we experienced there. Um, so my background is in crisis communications and public information, also um, business recovery is the work I've been doing over the last five years. Um, one thing that we wanted to talk to you about is that you will see multiple videos throughout this exercise. Um, the first video we'll be playing in just a moment. And the reason that we picked the videos that you will see is that because this is a category five exercise, we thought that we would go back to the last category five event that we experienced in Florida. And one of the communities hit hardest by the category five Hurricane Michael was Mexico Beach. Um, many of you saw the pictures and videos out of Mexico Beach after Hurricane Michael two years ago. And so we started our exercise with um, uh, obviously the idea of a category five hurricane hitting Tampa Bay, which you will see in the trailer video momentarily. And then we went to the experts. What happened the last time a Category 5 um, hurricane hit the state of Florida? What happened to the businesses and the residents? How did their recovery progress? So you'll follow along with some of the recovery from a Category 5 hurricane as we go through this exercise. Um, and we'll start the next, the first video now. There has been a noticeable shift in the forecast track. Forecasters say this storm could be one of the strongest ever to hit the Tampa Bay region. Phoenix is now a Category 5 hurricane. It is a historic storm and unfortunately making a beeline right now for our area. So how are we going to go about this uh, today, this morning? Uh, we're going to be breaking this into more or less two parts. Uh, the first part is more of the planning of how to plan this exercise. And then the second part is going to be how do we deliver it? So in case you haven't already asked yourself this question, uh, with them, what's with them? What's in it for me? Uh, I know you're sitting there saying, what am I getting out of this? Is this just going to be another 90 minute and I'm going to end up falling asleep or, or working on other, other things? Well, we certainly hope not. <clears throat> We're hopefully going to give you the ability to uh, create a strategy to build or further existing relationships. We want to increase understanding of each other's challenges. We're talking about the emergency management and small business community. Uh, we want to open up those communications between those groups. We want to improve community preparedness and resiliency. And obviously, uh, we want to promote you to rock star status. Uh, 
Uh, by the way, the, the video you just saw will be your opening video for the exercise. So when we get to that part, remember that we watched that video. And the frame folks have, have done a great job. So let's give credit where credit is due. Uh, the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, um, they've, they've took on this challenge. Um, and it's been a, a, a great a journey, I'll tell you. Uh, the US Economic Development Administration, the EDA, has provided the grant funding for this. Critical Integrated Solutions, uh, overall project management and exercise development. And then Frame did a great job with the film support. So if you haven't already downloaded the playbook, pretty much this webinar follows that playbook. So if you have that handy, or if you can open it up on another screen, uh, that'll be helpful because what we want is for you to be comfortable with that playbook, understanding where you can find things and how you can move things around. Uh, we really feel like this is going to be uh, a really a, a big ace in a hole for you if you're going to uh, execute this exercise. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that playbook. So we've designed this playbook uh, for those who will plan and conduct the exercise. What we think is we've really given you the keys to the kingdom here. Uh, you can ask Mike, uh, myself, or anybody else who's conducted exercise. It can be a long, arduous process, even if it's a tabletop exercise. So with these tools uh, <clears throat> that we're giving you, and you can see on the third bullet here, uh, some of these tools. And of course, this webinar will also be posted up on, on, the, on the website that you can go back and reference over and over again. Uh, so what you get is the playbook. Uh, you also get the situation manual, and the situation manual is the document that, that um, the players get. Uh, and within the playbook is the facilitator's guide. So that is what you will use as a facilitator uh, to lead through the exercise during the actual execution. So these tools uh, should give you everything you need to do this. And remember, all of these materials are modifiable. You can modify this uh, to, to your own needs, and you can localize it. And we, we actually encourage you to do that. Okay. There we go. So let's talk about a little bit of the overview. The original Project Phoenix tabletop exercise was from August uh, 2010. And I can tell you, I speak to folks that are up in Jacksonville working in a planning coalition there, and they still remember that exercise. So that exercise has had a long shelf life and it's still being referenced. And it also was a category five hurricane uh, with a direct hit on the Tampa Bay area. In fact, we utilize that same storm information um, to help build this exercise. Of course, we updated the damage estimates as we went through there. But the, one of the big differences is that uh, we, we were not focused on catastrophic planning as we did in that exercise. Uh, we are focusing on small business recovery. We know that small businesses can be the lifeblood of, of our communities. So our goals and objectives for this, uh, again, we want to bring together small business community and emergency managers. We want to identify solutions. We want to increase understanding of emergency managers facing uh, problems facing small businesses, uh, improve communication, increase the understanding of small business and business organizations of how local governments uh, respond to hurricanes. And, you know, let's not forget um, our, other, our other community leaders uh, that, that can also help us uh, in small business recovery. Uh, certainly, we want to invite them. We want to include them as well, like your chambers. So let's talk about planning team considerations. Uh, and remember, I want, I want you to remember, you know, you're putting together a planning team. Uh, we want you to include those people that will be representative of, of the participants. So we want emergency managers to be part of the planning team. 
and we had them part of the planning team for this process that we first started out with, with Project Phoenix 2.0. We also would like members of small business to be a part of this, because who knows their world better uh, than them. So the planning team is going to manage the exercise design, development, conduct, and evaluation. So as I said, we, we will include representatives from relevant disciplines. And we ask that the team players not be exercise players. They're kind of our secret squirrel, so to speak. Uh, we don't want them to give away the end of the movie, you know, so to speak. So uh, that's, that's, that's kind of what the planning team responsibilities and considerations are. Let's talk about a lead planner. So, ooh, lead planner's got a job. Uh, they're the project manager, they're the, they're the chief cat herder. They're responsible for conducting the planning meetings. They're responsible for setting and holding firm to the deadline. They are the point of contact for everybody regarding the exercise, whether that's uh, people that want to attend, uh, people that uh, you're coordinating with for facility usage, um, for your evaluators or note takers. Uh, so there's, they're, they're responsible for a lot. But we really think, our team really thinks that uh, with the materials that we've provided you, we, we kind of get you to the 90% mark. And it's up to you to adapt and change and adjust that. And, and we'll talk uh, more about that shortly. So exercise planning meetings, typically uh, there are four of them. Uh, and how long, does it, how long do you need to set aside to execute this exercise? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's, it's really gonna depend on, on a couple factors. Uh, probably one of the top factors is how much do you think you're gonna need to change the material that we provided to you? Uh, if there's not much change, it's probably not gonna take a lot of time. You know, so it can be any, any way, anywhere from 30 days to six months. And I can tell you that uh, uh, Mike and I had conducted a full-scale multi-jurisdictional exercise uh, from going from the very first planning meeting to the actual uh, execution of the full-scale exercise in 33 days. I don't recommend that. Uh, so take a look at, at uh, what you have to do and, and kind of, okay, I think it's going to take us about this long. It also depends on how many people you have involved in the planning, you know, that, that team. So the four meetings we're talking about here are the concept and objective meeting, the initial planning meeting, and we have them on the same line here because we encourage you to combine these. Uh, then we have the midterm planning meeting and then the final planning meeting. So again, the amount of time is going to be determined by uh, how much you're going to change the change the checklist or the templates. So what are you going to do? Uh, what are your outcomes for your concept and objective and initial planning meeting? Uh, you want to review to start off with the materials that we've already provided to you. Uh, don't recreate the wheel. You know, look at all the materials including the situation manual. Uh, you want to validate the objectives. You can add, subtract as needed. You want to make sure uh, the scenario fits your needs. You may want to localize the scenario, and we'll talk about that when we actually get into the facilitation guide. And you want to look at the modeling and simulation that's in there. You want to begin to look at your location where the venue, the date and duration of the exercise, how long that exercise is going to be. Uh, are you going to do it in four hours? Do you only have two hours? Uh, and another consideration is given the circumstances that we're currently under, you can deliver this virtually just like we're doing this here today. So that, that is not a difficult thing to do. Uh, and if you, still, if you have concerns, and we're sitting here in the middle of, of hurricane season, uh, hopefully, the, the, it, it gets better from here, um, but history has shown us the past couple of years that uh, 
September, October have been pretty rough months. So you can do this virtually if you're, if you're concerned about the current environment. You also want to begin looking at a date or establish a date for your midterm planning meetings. Uh, and you'll have to determine whether or not this is gonna be an officially evaluated exercise. So you also wanna assign people to adjust the materials based on the outcomes of this meeting. So adjusting the sit man, adjusting the facilitator guide. Uh, so when you come to the next meeting, they should be in draft format. So to evaluate or not to evaluate. So there's challenges in evaluating uh, the exercise since tracking improvements from the small business community may be difficult. These guys are, are or gals are, are running around, um, probably putting in long hours to, to, keep, to sustain their business. And it may be difficult for them to report back on, on certain timelines that, that you would ordinarily do for a formal after action report. In lieu of, at the end of the exercise, you have the opportunity perhaps to do an executive act after action summary report. Uh, this would vary a little bit from the HC concept. Uh, it would be a report, uh, an executive summary, uh, that shows uh, the areas needed for improvement uh, and you know, innovative thoughts or ideas that, that can be shared throughout the small business and emergency management community. Now, there may be a requirement if you're conducting this and it's grant funded, there may be a requirement that you have to have an after action report, in which case you're gonna want a formal evaluation process, uh, which also means uh, you'll want to use exercise evaluation guides, which are, uh, are available on the PREP Toolkit website. And that will be, you can find that in front of your, of your uh, playbook. There's a link to that. And that also contains um, other, other draft documents that you can use. <clears throat> so, Whatever the process, the end product must be objective with an eye towards improving. Uh, <clears throat> we want participants' ability to address uh, exercise specific objectives. We want it to be within their capabilities. Let, let's, not, let's not put something, let's not set them up for failure, so to speak. Uh, we want it to be an objective overview of, of participant discussion, and that'll be part of the evaluation and also, as always, accurate, systematic, and a practical evaluation is an essential component of a successful exercise. So keep, keeping it honest. So did I skip one here? Okay, here we go. So the midterm planning meeting. Remember, we made those assignments in the initial planning meeting. We said, ask people to, we assigned the work. Um, please come back with draft documents. Hopefully they sent them to you in advance and you could then send them out to the rest of the team to review before you get to the midterm planning meeting. So again, we're looking at the situation manual, the PowerPoint, the facilitator's guide, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> so we want agreement on the exercise site, date and time. You want to begin to lock that down. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you want to finalize the date, time, and location of the final planning meeting, that's the FPM, uh, and you wanna determine your facilitators. And we recommend that you have an emergency manager uh, as one facilitator and somebody that is familiar with small business disaster recovery as your second. Uh, it just kind of makes sense that you have that balance because those are the participants that are gonna be in the room. And you'll need to determine when to send out invitations, um, to who and how those are gonna go out. And typically those, those go out via, via email. And then again, you also have to think about, about your venue. You know, are you gonna do this virtually uh, or, or are you gonna actually have a location? So that, that needs to be included as well. And again, we, we have those assignments, we send them back out for finalization and those documents come back in our final planning meeting. You know, the final planning meeting is really where we are dotting the I's and crossing the D's 
fees. We try to conduct this at about a week out to allow time for last minute adjustments. And this is important if you're actually putting product to print. Uh, you wanna have that time to, to uh, make those corrections and, and either print it locally or, or bring it to a, a local business. So we also want to lock down and make sure that all our logistical elements in place, you know, our facility is, our venue is, is scheduled, locked down, um, whatever equipment, that could be AV equipment, could be speaker equipment, uh, microphones, uh, <clears throat> and that our, our schedule is all confirmed. And then we want to resolve any open planning issues. So take into consideration Murphy's Law. We'll talk about Murphy's Law here in a little bit. And so once we come out of this, it's, it's, it's showtime. It's ready to go. What we've included in, in your playbook, and I think it's about page 10, it's a pretty comprehensive, uh, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> Uh, it's a pr pretty comprehensive uh, checklist. Let's advance the slide. There we go. Pretty comprehensive checklist on all the steps in conducting the exercise. Uh, now, keep in mind, this checklist also includes full-scale exercise. I know we're talking about tabletop exercises, but a lot of those meetings, the IPM, the FPM, and the NPM, they're, 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 <clears throat> They could go across all the exercises. So if you're using our, our templates, uh, a lot of these things are going to be knocked out for you. But there's some good things in here, good triggers, good reminders for you to use. So we encourage you to use them. And I think at this point, uh, I want to bring in Mr. Beha uh, for his words of wisdom. Uh, uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, you uh, Ben. One of the things I've learned is that the way you get uh, that you have that you have wisdom is by making uh, mistakes. So I'd like to share with you some of the of the lessons I've learned from making uh, mis uh, mistakes and the 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 first lesson learned is uh, the secret to success uh, happens way before the exercise actually starts. Number one, you want to build a strong uh, uh, team. Um, by that, I mean people who understand what exercises are or who, who, are, who are capable, uh, knowledgeable, helpful. Uh, yeah, the, the, the kind of folks that can make things happen when things go wrong because uh, lesson learned, things will uh, 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 go wrong. Uh, uh, the, one of the things that I like is, is to have a, have a group of folks that I don't have to spend a whole lot of time uh, telling them what needs to be done. They already already know. So that's number one. Second thing, match the exercise to meet your uh, needs. Uh, very often, we do exercises that are already written up or are already designed for a larger audience or a, another audience. Uh, you want to make sure you match the exercise to what it is specifically that you need. Uh, sometimes a smaller, more focused exercise is. Uh, is 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 exactly what you're looking for, and and then then lastly, the the meeting should not be a time where you you where you work on the the on the uh, documents. The meeting should be a time where you can check the the uh, status of the work that's that that's been uh, been done as you move along. So with that, I'll. Uh, I will uh, will uh, pass it uh, back to uh, uh, um, uh, Ben St. John. So now we're going to talk about coordinating the tabletop. Uh, again, these are items that are, are in your playbooks. In this section, we're going to talk about facilitation, venues, uh, 
evaluators versus note takers, and probably a couple of other things as well. So let's talk about selecting a facilitator. I don't recommend bringing on a pigeon to do an eagle's work. Uh, whoever is standing in front of the room, those, those two people that we recommended, uh, they can make or break your exercise. Uh, they must skillfully manage the per participants. Uh, you know, if you look in your playbook on or about page 19, you'll find a list of FEMA's characteristics and skill sets of a good facilitator. And so really, really put some thought into who you're gonna have standing in front of the room or even virtually. So some examples of good facilitator, facilitator skills or traits include, uh, they have to be a good negotiator. Uh, there's gonna be times where there's gonna be some conflict or misunderstandings of perhaps what guidance says. Of course, you want them to be tactful. They you want them to demonstrate leadership skills. Uh, they have to be impartial and they need to keep the, the discussion focused. So what are some of the facilitators' responsibilities? They're gonna assist the group by summarizing a point rather than restating, uh, restating a, a, a key discussion point. They're gonna watch for signs of frustration or conflict and, and manage that conflict. And sometimes that means, hey, let's, let's take a break. They wanna to try to make sure that they keep the discussion within the scope of the giving area. And if it starts moving out of scope, you know, perhaps use that old parking lot concept and you know, write it up on, on the butcher paper or up on the whiteboard and, and save that for afterwards. Uh, and importantly, you want to involve all of the participants. You know, there's some folks that, that will take over the show if you let them. Uh, you need to make sure other folks have an opportunity to uh, join in on, on that. So let's talk about venue considerations. <clears throat> Again, we said uh, there's an opportunity for you to do this uh, virtually. Uh, if you're able to do this, in a, in a facility or in a room, um, you know, that's also fantastic. And during these times, you have to consider social distancing. Uh, you know, the exercise, as we said, is scalable to meet the needs of your community. Uh, consider audio and visual requirements. That's, that's really important because uh, if you have a lot of people, uh, the acoustics in the room and the sound and the microphones and the speakers, all that has to be taken into consideration. Also, uh, make sure you think about those that, that require special accommodations, folks that uh, perhaps are in a wheelchair or are visually impaired. Uh, so take them into consideration. Um, <clears throat> and we really specifically designed this exercise to, to maximize the interface between emergency managers and small business owners. Uh, and we'll see that in a little bit, but really that's, that's, that's where we feel you're going to get the most bang for your buck. So when we look at, uh, you know, room layouts, which you see here, there's a couple, a couple different ways, and there's more ways than this. For example, you may be conducting this exercise in your emergency operations center, or perhaps in an auditorium. Um, these, what you see here, are, are two typical ones. Uh, you know, group seating, if you have a number of people, but if you only have 10 to 15, you may, may use the U-shaped style or a conference room. And, you know, depending on the number of participants, uh, may change your facilitation style. So we've got it designed, uh, and, and you'll see this coming up, that at the end of each module, there's questions that emergency managers are going to ask small business owners, and vice versa questions small business owners will ask emergency managers. Uh, if you only have 10 people, it may not make sense to put them in, in a group. It may be that you, as the facilitator, are asking the questions of the group. Otherwise, if you do have a number of people and you use the group seating, then they can ask those questions amongst themselves. So those are some of the impacts of, of more or less people. Uh, but it, it, it works either way. 
And even if you do it virtually, uh, depending on the number of people and what platform you're using, uh, certainly you can facilitate those questions online, kind of like the way Sarah and I are doing it for, for this event. So those are a, a couple options for you. So what are the evaluator and note taker uh, responsibilities? Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. So, you know, what they capture during this exercise, their, their notes are, are gonna be really key to writing an effective after action report and an improvement plan if that's the direction you're going. So you wanna consider bringing in experts from neighboring jurisdictions so it doesn't impact your participants. Uh, so if you can bring in neighboring folks and then you know, return the favor to them down the road, that would be great. You know, so having those subject matter experts with knowledge of participating organizations, plans, policies, and procedures, and be able to anticipate the emergency management or small business response to the scenario is gonna be helpful. We'd also like evaluators or note takers to have well-rounded knowledge of local continuity of operations guidance. That'll also be helpful. Let's move on and talk about facilitator tips. Uh, <clears throat> pardon. Know and understand the subject area at hand. Obviously, we, we talked about having subject matter experts. Uh, must understand small bus business owner needs and the resources available to them. And that's going to be important as you're a facilitator is understanding what resources are available to them. And that's kind of why we recommended having somebody with small business recovery experience as one of the facilitators. Uh, now, the last bullet, and I think that's on about page 19 of your playbook, uh, Murphy's Law, everything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong. So everything on page 19, I have personally experienced. And I, I'll tell you for today, uh, planning on Murphy's Law, I haven't changed the batteries on my mouse in about six months. And my fear was it was gonna die in the middle of this and I wouldn't know what to do. So I changed out the batteries last night. So just preparing for Murphy's Law. So now we're moving into conducting the exercise. Um, as we move forward in our presentation, uh, we're gonna be talking about and we're gonna move into the facilitator's guide and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but we're gonna be covering information that, that it will be in the facilitator's guide and the participant situation manual. Uh, this exercise is broken into four modules. It's one day after landfall, one week after landfall, and then in module three, we have one to six months after landfall. And then finally, finally in module four, one year after landfall. So initially we designed this exercise to be a four hour tabletop uh, and our breakdown by the hour you can see on the sub bullets below. And what we wanna highlight again is we really want to focus time on group discussions between small business and emergency managers and others that are essential to the small business recovery process. And then in between the modules, we want them to share results of those conversations with the rest of the participants in the room. So again, I'd like to bring back uh, our local expert, uh, Mr. Beha. Can we get some of your words of wisdom, sir? Um, well, I don't think I've ever been involved with an exercise where there is so much uh, d data, so much stuff. Uh, we collected a whole lot of stuff, um, uh, damage information in 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 each of the six uh, of the six uh, counties, um, and 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 it would be easy to to be over 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 uh, over overwhelmed with all of it. So what I would recommend is uh, simply customize. Don't use everything, use what you need to uh, 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 do your exercise for, for the people that, that are, are involved in your exercise. And then 
let me just emphasize do registration and lunch right. Um, the, 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 the uh, most, the things that are most commented on, on evaluations are registration and, and lunch. I, I can tell you from a, from a personal experience, one of the, of the absolute, absolute, uh, absolutely the best exercises that I was involved in de developing, registration took forever. It, it, it took probably an hour and a half. We, we must have had 600 people in the exercise and we were totally overwhelmed. And guess what showed up on the evals? So not that it was a wonderful exercise, but that we needed to work on registration. And then secondly, in lunch. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you that you, you have to serve lunch or snacks or whatever. However, what I am saying is if you're going to have people for uh, an extended period of time, you need to make sure you provide snacks, lunch, whatever it is, because uh, uh, again, that will become the, fo the focus of their evals, uh, not the, the exercise. Okay. Thank you, and let's move on. Thank you, Mike. So we're back to a uh, uh, question and answer period. Uh, if anybody has any questions, can you please raise your hand? And I'll ask Ms. Sarah, are there any questions waiting in the Q&A box? Uh, no questions just yet. Um, okay. But I have a question. So sure. uh, considering the, the social distance requirements we're facing these days, I, I was hoping you could speak to your thoughts on conducting a virtual tabletop exercise and shifting these materials to an online format. Absolutely, it's it's very doable. Um, in fact, you know, as you know, uh, what we're doing today was it was going to be an in-person exercise. That you had a great facility picked out, uh, and due to conditions, we we had to be flexible and adaptable. And here we are online. Uh, so it's a matter of platform. You know, this particular platform I think is very good. Uh, if you have a large number of participants, I think it allows you to break them off into groups so they can have their own private conversations and then you can bring them back as a whole. So I can't speak to all the platforms out there, but I have used platforms before virtually uh, for the Department of Health. I know FEMA uh, uses a virtual platform. It's not as flexible as what Zoom is, and I'm not certain that they've transition to Zoom at this point. But uh, with those virtual uh, exercises, you know, you have people across, uh, you, across the county, it could be, in FEMA's case, across the country, and they'll go through the module, and once they get to the, hey, we want your group to, to answer these questions, they put everybody on mute. Uh, somebody at that outside location, pick San Francisco. Uh, they'll have their conversation there. They'll bring everybody back up uh, and they will go to each location and ask them to brief out online, you know, what the results of their conversations were. And then they would continue uh, online with the, with the next module. So uh, that's something very doable uh, in, in this particular exercise, the way it's laid out. So, uh, yeah, during the, during this time and in, in, in the middle of hurricane season, it's an absolute possibility to do that. Did that answer your question, Sarah? Yeah, thank you. That was helpful. So we don't have any raised hands at this point. Okay. Then so we can we keep shall, on going. We shall carry on. So community lifelines. Community lifelines is is kind of new to the FEMA and emergency management realm in terms of this particular format. Uh, this has been adopted by the Florida Division of Emergency Management. However, I will say that 
it has not been mandated for use across the state. So it's voluntary for use. But I will tell you that uh, whether emergency managers are formally using this strategy, they are evaluating all of these things, whether it's in this format or not. So what you see on your screen now, these are the overarching broad lifeline categories. Uh, the facilitators, your facilitators, or you if you're going to be the facilitator, should understand the lifelines and determine the status of them and be able to summarize the strategy. So in our next slide here, you're going to see the subcategories of each of these lifelines. And you can see uh, how each of these can impact the community in one way or the other, and why they're, they're really kind of essential. Uh, so one of the things that is gonna be important to the participants as we go through uh, our exercise, and, and we'll see where this comes into play, is we're gonna ask the folks in their groups, you know, our small business owners teamed with an emergency manager, uh, have that discussion of, in the middle of the storm, how are you evaluating our critical infrastructure and getting an understanding of what emergency managers are doing? So you can see on this slide here, this is why uh, the Lifeline system has come about. Uh, I really want to emphasize the, the bottom bullet here. A Lifeline enables the continuous operation of critical government and business functions and is essential to human health and safety or economic security. You know, we said before that small business is, is the lifeblood of the community. Uh, we know how, how catastrophic uh, a storm can be. Uh, we witnessed that in, in, with Hurricane Michael two years ago. In fact, uh, I lost a house at Hurricane Michael uh, two years ago, and I was working in, as a volunteer in the Leon County Emergency Operations Center during Hurricane Michael. So it can have a devastating impact you know, across the board. It can have impacts across schools, uh, transportation routes. Uh, it can shut down hospitals, transportation routes. So these are all things that uh, an emergency manager has to take into consideration. And small business has got to be concerned about because it's a matter of getting them back uh, to being operational. So lifelines are the most fundamental services in the community that when stabilized, enable all our aspects of society to function. Uh, so if you wanna learn more about lifelines on that bottom bullet there, there's a link there. And I'll tell you, there's a, a, a plethora of information on lifelines available for you. So I would encourage you as a facilitator uh, to uh, be knowledgeable of these community lifelines. If you're gonna have an emergency manager uh, as a facilitator, they are likely going to be somewhat aware of these already. So on our next slide here, uh, this talks about the process. And what we'd like is for the facilitator to walk the participants through the process and spend a couple of minutes at the end of each module uh, and during their group, group, during their group discussions, assigning a status of the lifelines. So we would ask that in the, in the beginning of the exercise, and we'll see where that comes into play uh, when we get into the facilitator's guide, just basically walk them through this chart so they get an understanding of, of how to assign that. Now, when we actually get into the exercise, we're not gonna ask them to spend a lot of time uh, doing this. In fact, we, we just want them to give a best guess. Exercise execution. This is, this is the part we are actually gonna walk you through the facilitator's guide. And I believe that starts on page 22 of your playbook. Uh, so the slides that we're gonna be looking at here are gonna be the same slides that are on the PowerPoint that you will present to the participants. And there will also be the same slides that are contained in their situation name. So remember, uh, we watched that, that first video and that was kind of the, the teaser, the, the trailer, so to speak. 
So you want to use that video. This is at the very beginning of the exercise uh, <clears throat> where people have wandered into the room, they begin taking the seats. Some may be over by where you have the coffee pot chatting. Uh, this is where you can ask folks to, you know, please take your seats. Um, you may want to dim the lights. Uh, you may want to close the doors and you'll play that video. And that would be the very first video that we played for you here today. It's the trailer. It's the thing that, that are going to get things rolling. So we are now actually in the exercise facilitation guide. This is you now standing at the podium or wherever you will be standing. And you are actually now delivering the exercise. So as I go through this, I am not going to read to you every slide, and it's going to be difficult for you to read what's on the slides. But what I do want you to focus on is the facilitator notes as we go through them. And remember, everything you see here is modifiable. As Sarah said in the beginning, these materials are posted up to their website, and they are both in PDF and in Word format, so you can modify those. And we encourage you to localize those. So as we go through here, um, you, want to, you, know, you want to discuss you know, where did, and I'm looking at slide two here in the middle, uh, where, where did the Project Phoenix stem from? Where did that uh, begin? How, did, how, how has it evolved over time? Uh, on that bottom slide, slide three, uh, let's give credit where credit's due, but I would also offer that you can put your logo up there as well, your county logo, your Chamber of Commerce logo, uh, whatever logo that is that are going to be the prime sponsor of the, sponsors of the exercise. So uh, we encourage you to do that. Let's see. Okay. So in this very first part here, as we go through this, this is, this is the administrative notes section. And I'll tell you, it's going to take me a couple of minutes to explain this, but at most, I, wouldn't, I would say this is going to take you 15 minutes or less as you're standing up in front of people. So slide four, this is your ex exercise participant list. You want to modify what is currently on that slide to represent those folks that are, that are going to be in your room. Uh, during your planning process for slide five, uh, this is your agenda and your schedule. You know, during that planning process, you're going to adjust this to whatever your local needs are going to be. Uh, and that may be a two hour, that may be a four hour. Uh, it may be only module one and module two. So it's going to be based on what the planning team came up with. And then the bottom slide, slide six. This is your participant roles and responsibilities. So I'll say the players are going to understand who they are and the facilitators are going to know who they are. Uh, you may want to uh, point out or introduce the evaluators or the note takers uh, and put consideration into your observers where you're going to have them and also the press. Consider where they're going to be uh, in advance. Uh, so there's no interference during exercise play unless it's by design. Uh, we don't want to interrupt the players in the middle of their conversations, uh, but our observers should be able to listen in, but we ask them not to interact. And the press are going to want to, you know, they're going to want to take their photos and film footage. Uh, and, and that's fine. Just work with them in advance. Let's talk about objectives. What you see up on the slide right now is the FEMA's preparing the cycle. And if you look at the purple at the bottom left, you can see exercise. And, and that's, that's where we are in this process. And for small business owners, this may be the start of this cycle. They may have never gone through this before. So really what I'd like for you to think about is after you do this exercise, how do you move into that next step, which is evaluate and improve? Uh, so have that conversation of what your end product, what your end result is going to be after the exercise, whether that's going to be an after action report or an, an executive after action summary or follow on training or follow on seminars on how to write a plan, things of that nature. So we, we want you to, to kind of discuss that 
uh, and we think that'll, that'll be help, helpful. And when you look at slide eight, this is where we get into uh, our FEMA core capabilities, which are in bold, such as community resilience. And then everything that follows that is the actual objective. So in this, in this top example, increase the understanding of small business and business organizations of how local governments respond to hurricanes and how recovery proceeds. So you don't have to read these slides for them. You can say, hey, uh, take a look at these objectives. This is what we are, we are looking at today. And there's two slides of objectives. Uh, then we move on to the next slide, slide 10, assumptions and artificialities. You're going to have folks that are going to want to fight the scenario. Oh, that would never happen. You know, a category five is not going to wipe out the entire community. Uh, so I'll tell you that we use Hazus HM uh, to come up with the data for this exercise. And so it's based on modeling. So when you compare modeling versus ground truth, there's going to be a difference. We understand that. Uh, but this is the best science that we have right now. Uh, so we asked them not to, not, to fight the, not, not to fight the scenario here. So we have exercise uh, player guidelines. You know, hey, this is, we, we, we don't want you to get stressed out over, over this. This is a low stress, no fault environment. Um, ask folks to come back from breaks on time or just start without them. I mean, uh, you, want, you need to maintain your schedule. Uh, decisions aren't precedent making, and you're exploring options and you're brainstorming during this. In slide 13, we want to get the participants to focus on suggestions and recommendations, problem solving, and focus on today's que questions. Don't, don't get sidetracked. And then evaluation, explain to them what your evaluation strategy is going to be, uh, whether you're going to have a formal after action report or not and what that end product is going to look like. Then we're going to talk about community lifelines, which we've already discussed, but you're going to explain to them what the community lifelines are. And then there in slide 16, you're going to talk about what the process is. And then on that bottom slide, slide 17, uh, you want to show them that you don't want your local small businesses to be part of these st statistics. So that's, that's what you can say there. All right. So now we are, we've gone through all the administrative slides. We are now getting ready to move into the actual exercise. Now we have the administrative things out of the way. And I'll ask Sarah at this point, Sarah, are you able to bring up this video for us? And we have Category 1 Hurricane Phoenix just south of Jamaica now. Phoenix is currently expected to make landfall in the Yucatan Peninsula as a Category 2 storm. But of course, always, we are keeping a close eye on this system. There has been a noticeable shift in the forecast track from the NHC overnight, which now brings Phoenix into our viewing area, possibly as a strong hurricane. Now is the time to begin those preparations, folks. We have breaking news this morning. If you're just joining us, the National Hurricane Center has upgraded our entire viewing area to a hurricane warning as Hurricane Phoenix is projected to make landfall as a major hurricane sometime tomorrow. Mandatory evacuations are in effect for all coastal regions. Forecasters say this storm could be one of the strongest ever to hit the Tampa Bay region. We cannot stress enough how crucial it is that you finish your storm preparations tonight. Conditions will deteriorate rapidly rapidly tomorrow morning and evacuation routes will quickly become impassable. Please don't take this lightly and heed all evacuation orders. Folks, this is unfortunately the worst case scenario unfolding for the Tampa Bay area. Phoenix is now a category five hurricane with maximum sustained winds at 160 miles an hour. 
The wind gusts up to 200 miles per hour. This is catastrophic. It is a historic storm and unfortunately making a beeline right now for our area. We have a live look right now at North Tampa and Polk Street. I believe this is near Kawa Coffee, and as you can see, the storm surge has completely inundated downtown. Law enforcement now is reporting that all bridges have been cut off by storm surge. We're looking at up to 20 feet of storm surge in some spots. We're trapped on the third floor of the Tampa General Hospital parking garage, and the storm surge is up to the second floor of the hospital. St. Petersburg is essentially an island right now. A viewer from Brooksville is reporting roofs being torn off of businesses there, so this is a very important reminder that this is not just a coastal storm. We are seeing significant wind damage well inland. this morning is unimaginable. The beaches are essentially gone. The Howard Franklin Bridge is completely destroyed. I've never seen anything like this. Officials are scrambling to clean up debris from local airports in order for supplies to be flown in. We are getting reports from Home Assassa of residents trapped by downed trees. There's not a single business that we've driven by that doesn't have significant damage. Tampa General Hospital has told us that they are unable to receive any patients after the hospital suffered significant damage from wind and storm surge. The level of destruction out here is indescribable. It's going to be a very long road to recovery for the Tampa Bay area. Wow, uh, that's, that's an impactful video. And I think that's gonna draw your, your audience in. It's gonna get, get their attention. So as we continue to move through, you can see on slide 19 and slide 20, uh, this gives a little bit of a timeline. I wouldn't recommend that you spend a lot of time on these things. You could show it up there. You can say, hey, you can kind of see how the storm has built, how, how it started uh, coming in our direction. Then we get into slide 21 here. Again, some more timeline. Uh, and now we are looking at slide 22. And <clears throat> we're looking at now it's one day later, okay? And so the next six slides uh, are gonna show impacts on the various communities. And you see the very bottom one there is Citrus County. So uh, you as a facility, facilitator or a exercise planner in your community, feel free to remove uh, these additional counties. You can leave them there for context, which may be helpful to give them the overall picture. And also feel free to adjust and add or localize the information uh, to, better, uh, to better engage your community. So again, you can see here, and I wanna, wanna make a note as we go through here. Uh, the facilitator notes uh, largely come from the sit man and give you, a, you as the facilitator additional information beyond what's on the slide. So we're giving you the opportunity here um, to not just read off the sli slide, but to give them some, some additional information. And again, you can see the various counties, uh, you can, you can simply say, okay, here we see Hernando County, give them a couple of seconds to look at it, and then jump to Hillsboro, give them a chance to look at it, uh, and so on. So and we'll do the same with Pasco and Pinellas. And again, you can change those to best fit your needs. And then we get down to slide 29. And this is an area where you can insert your local information that impacts your community. 
So what can you put on this slide? You can use, uh, uh, you can focus on a particular business, uh, a cascading local event maybe, or additional closures. Uh, it may be about a bridge that is out and, and is gonna affect people uh, that are out uh, on the other side of that bridge. Uh, it could be businesses, it, it could be, you know, logistical impacts of how, do you, how do getting supplies there. So, you know, you can add as many slides as, as you'd like and, and take away uh, which, which you don't think you need. So, so we built that for you to use there. Now, uh, this, this slide, slide 30, uh, this is the wind surge tool. So this is an interactive tool. And if they have this uh, on their, the participants bring their laptops, they can bring this, bring this up. And you can also demonstrate this for them. So if you look in the top left-hand corner, I know it's kind of hard to see um, on this slide, but in the top left-hand corner, there's a place to put an address. So it can be a little tricky sometimes, but uh, as you enter the address, it will pop up for you. You can select that. And then you can hit enter. And out the top right corner, you can determine what damage you want to look at. It'll say wind or surge. And so what that will do is that will bring up the address they, they put in and they can see what level of damage, if any, they are sustaining. And I can tell you for uh, Hurricane Phoenix, uh, it's going to be pretty devastating uh, globally. So and then we move, after they get over that shock and off, <laughs> they're, they're going to move to community lifelines. And this is where now we are moving into their, into their groups. We've had the community lifelines discussion already, so you're gonna to explain to them, um, hey, now is your opportunity based on the information we've provided you on damage uh, to talk briefly with your emergency manager and do your best guess on what the damages are. And once you get through that, what we want you to do is now uh, looking at slide 32, we can see here, this is emergency managers asking small business owner questions. And the very first one says, what are the priorities of small business owners at this point? I know that's hard for you to read, uh, but have them have this discussion. Now there's a lot of questions and don't expect to, them to get through them all. Uh, feel free to modify these questions, shorten the list or add items that you think are important to your community. So then you see on slide 34, here's an opportunity for small business owners uh, to ask emergency managers some, some questions. And for example, uh, you know, what actions did you take in preparation for the storm? That's that's small business owner asking emergency manager. So, that, you know, those answers may vary. So once you've ended their discussion time and before you put them on break, let's ask for them to brief out the rest of the people in the room, what it is that they they came up with? What, what were their big problems or what were their innovative ideas? Uh, and this gives an opportunity for the note takers or the evaluators to take notes to help inform, uh, inform the after action report or whatever the end product will be. So on this bottom slide, you can see uh, we're going to break. Uh, as a facilitator, you're going to have to take a look at the time and the time uh, that you have to conduct the overall exercise and determine, you know, we had this set for a 10 minute break, but I went a little over. So uh, we're only going to take a five minute break. And then we move into the next module after that break, which was one, one week later. And we want to crowd folks back into their seats. And then we have our next video and that is slide 37. And I'll ask Ms. Sarah, are you able to bring up the, the second video or the third video for us, please?
that was some terrifying moments to, to ride that storm out. I mean, this storm took our family business. It took both of my son's homes. It took 75% of our community and destroyed all of the structures. No other city experienced anything like ours as far as devastation. It was a terrible, terrible sight. Remember, my home and all the landmarks that I'm accustomed to referring people to, Miss Sue's house with the blue roof, John's house with the bird house, they were all gone. There were no landmarks. I mean, this is our livelihood. This is how we make a living. This is, this is what we do every day. We come to work. And Michael's got it strode all over the all over the ground and and so there were some i mean those are tough feelings when you're in your 70s to see that you've worked all your life for that i was crying on other people's shoulders just like they were crying on mine i had some emotional issues that i just had to to sort out and I just had to sort of regroup. I had to pull back and, and, I mean, when I say I withdrew, I did. I went literally either in my truck or in my bedroom or in, I, I had to gather my thoughts before I could even approach anybody. And I mean, even my sons, I mean, they were, they were devastated. But the majority of the mom and pop business people to me, they're the salt of the community. They're the, they're the backbone of a, of a community. The people of this town are remarkable. We helped hunt for pictures or baby shoes or anything that people could were, were trying to find. It just gave us a sense of uh, togetherness that was sort of gave me some peace. Yeah, we lost a lot of things, but the best thing we can do is get busy, focus on putting our business back together, and that's exactly what we did. They gathered what they could, stored that away, and started making plans to get back to work. Wow, that's uh, that's some some video, uh, very impactful. And again, you know, why Mexico Beach? That that could be any community in the Tampa area after a Category Five hurricane. Um, we use Mexico Beach as uh, Miss Aaron had said earlier, uh, because that's the last Category Five that we've had in in Florida. And these are real people with real small businesses that, that took a devastating blow. And we're going to hear more from them as we move forward. So just like in module one, um, you look here on slide 38, uh, we're following the same format. We're, we're giving damage uh, reports uh, by the counties. Uh, here again, the, the facilitator notes uh, are likely to be different than what you see on, on the slides, and that's just to give you additional context. Uh, so we're gonna kind of move through those slides. Uh, again, you have the opportunity to adjust, remove, and add. Again, an opportunity to insert local information here. Uh, again, now we get back into our groups and we talk about community lifelines, uh, we're going to have them determine where they are at this point in time. So uh, now we're a week down the road. Uh, maybe some things are coming back. Uh, and, and a reminder that uh, <clears throat> that uh, you know there's reality and there's modeling. 
and you know we don't want them to to fight the exercise, so to speak. And by this point, they're they're probably adapted, uh, and I don't think you're going to have to be concerned at this point. And so now we move back into our groups, as I said, and here are, are the questions that are going to be asked. And you know, again, we'll see a question on there about okay, at this point in time, uh, what are your priorities? So it sounds like the same question as was in the first module. Well, it is the same question, but now they're in a different point in time, and that answer is likely to be different. So, so that's, you know, you'll see some of that. And I'll also tell you, as you go through these questions, um, some of these, you know, folks may be embarrassed to and not want to answer and not want, you know, do you have a plan? If they don't have a plan, they may not want to admit that. So, but they're going to recognize it and they're going to recognize that, hey, maybe I need a plan and where do I get a plan? And of course, you know, if that's the question, the, uh, the Planning Council website has a lot of resources uh, available there. So uh, take, you know, take advantage of that. I think I jumped here. And then again, we're sitting at right before break. We'd like for them to brief out everybody in the room on what they came up with. Um, and let's document that uh, for our after action report or whatever that is going to be. And then we head into another break. Uh, and again, judge uh, how long that's gonna be. And right now we have just completed module one and module two. So at this point, we're at the halfway point. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mike if he has uh, any words of wisdom at this point in the exercise. Mike? Mike, are you there? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Right, yes. I got you. Uh, you know, again, we, we're we pr providing a lot of information. We're pr providing so much stuff that uh, it's, in, it's important that as you're, as you're building your exercise, that you have owner, you have ownership that you have a, 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 a group involved that's going to be owners of the exercise. Uh, and, and to be honest, that uh, this is a, this is an area where, you know, business owners probably don't have a lot of experience with exercises. They, they, they don't have a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, time to, uh, spend, uh, planning and working on it. So you're going to have to really look to find uh, people who can help you uh, that have ownership of of uh, of of the exercise. And that's it. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, sir. Uh, at this point, I would like to see if, uh, if there's any questions out there in phone land. Uh, if so, please raise your hand or um, put it in the Q&A box, and I'll ask Ms. Sarah, do we have any questions? Uh, nothing yet. All right. So having no questions, uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to pass the baton to Ms. Erin Gillespie to uh, carry us through Module 3, module three and into Module 4. Ms. Erin? Thanks, Ben. Um, so this is the area um, starting in module three that we, we look at one to six months later. And it's really the tr transition between short and long-term recovery. And that's an interesting discussion. Okay, um, this is the discussion that really starts from short to long-term recovery. So Sarah, we're actually gonna play this video and then get into that discussion. was prepared for a hurricane, but I wasn't prepared for all this. I wasn't prepared for my city to be devastated. I wasn't prepared to come home to a town that was flattened. 
and it reminded me of things I had seen on television with a bomb explosion or a tidal wave. It was unbelievable. I mean, my heart just sank because this was our little spot in paradise. I worked my way to the canal here where I kept my boat and the canal was so full of debris, you could barely see that there was water in the canal. Off to my right, there were two boats sitting up on the hill here in the road. And there was another boat behind us that was pushed all the way almost to Highway 98. helping as much as we could until the day I got a phone call from the boatyard saying you've got to come move your boat and my question was where am I going to put it fortunately for us Captain Anderson's pier in Panama City Beach uh, they had a spot and I was able to move my boat over there park it and we could start making repairs to my charter boat as a small business owner, I had to turn to the Small Business Administration, some of FEMA, those type of things to go, hey guys, I need help. So basically we had enough money to pay for a place to park our boat. Our insurance helped us with repairs and we just kind of sat there and uh, worked on helping the community at the same time doing what we could to get our business at least to where it was floating. Through some blessings of uh, a couple of my sponsors, uh, we were able to purchase the boat behind us. And one of the main reasons we bought it is we could get out of town. I could put it on a trailer and haul it north. I believe that this is where the good in people really comes through. And the support that we got along with our community was overwhelming. All right, I don't know about you guys, but these videos are giving me chills watching them through um, and seeing the impact of this storm and how people came together to really recover. And I think they really show a great lesson for the emergency managers and small business owners who will watch this exercise down the road to see you know, that it can be done, but that it's hard. And I think that's a really good lead in to what we're talking about here in module three is short-term to long-term recovery um, really means nothing to the people on the ground, right? They're recovering every moment of every day, trying to get their life back together. But it does mean something in terms of, of, of government and how funding is released and how the community can begin to rebuild. And so that's really where this module takes us into the areas of um, of small business recovery, um, FEMA dollars coming out, SBA dollars coming out. And this slide at the bottom, slide 53, uh, is a really good place to talk to um, your audience about what does short, when does short-term recovery change to long-term recovery? Is that when stores and other businesses reopen, when schools reopen, when government offices reopen, when the shelters are finally closed and people no longer need that assistance, when the streets are open to travel? And, uh, you know, everybody's answer is probably going to be different about that. They're going to again, be in the midst of their own personal recovery. What we saw in Mexico Beach and in many other areas of the Panhandle were people's businesses and homes got destroyed. And so they couldn't focus on getting their business back together until they had a, a safe place to live. Um, we saw that in Irma, especially in the Keys. After that hurricane, um, people lost everything and they really couldn't focus on their economic recovery until, um, until the, their personal life was a little bit back to normal. 
Okay, and now we go back to the counties. I mean, uh, as Ben mentioned earlier, this is, um, there's obviously impacts to every county, which will be helpful as you present it to your audience, but it's also interesting and helpful to see the impacts in surrounding counties, especially for a county like Hillsborough, where people are commuting in from these rural counties um, into work in the, the metro area. Um, and so looking at the differences in the counties, you know, um, just for a quick example, like you can see that in Citrus County, um, thousands of people left the area. We saw that in Panama City. Um, they, people left the area and they're actually really concerned now with the census going on that there's going to be so many fewer people in the area because there just wasn't enough housing or any other um, ways for them to get back to normal. Um, counties have to set up temporary medical facilities and, te and temporary classrooms and many of you have seen this happen as you have um, been a part of emergencies. Um, mental health needs, if we're looking at Manatee County, that was one of the things we wanted to definitely talk about. In Bay County, after um, Michael, months later, you saw that the number of Baker Acts, especially among children, really skyrocketed because children had so many uh, traumatic events happen with schools closed, their parents being home, losing their house or their, their parents losing their jobs. Um, and it, it just took so long for things to get back to normal that kids really experienced this trauma and adults as well. I mean, I think in the video, um, you really see a good example of, um, of a 70 year old man who's saying he had to go into his room and cry before he could talk to people. I mean, that's hard to talk about. It's hard to see. And it's really hard to, to recover when you're facing those challenges. Um, some businesses will decide to stay closed. Uh, we're seeing that now if you want to take this hurricane exercise and relate it to COVID. Um, businesses that are having to close down and just deciding that they just they can't make it anymore. They can't keep trying. And you see that after a hurricane. Um, which is why being prepared for business is so important that if you don't have the tools necessary to recover and you shut down temporarily, chances are you may never reopen. And that's very scary for our communities. Um, you know, businesses do have the ability to take advantage of programs offered by the state and the federal government. In the short term, the Florida Small Business Emergency Bridge Loan Program is a really quick way to provide cash to businesses to get up and running. Um, but then they owe that money back. Um, it is interest free, but they owe it back usually from their insurance or the SBA loan that they will then receive for long term recovery that must be paid back. Uh, we get a lot of questions about businesses that want grants and that just really doesn't exist in in, in disaster world, you know, there's business loan programs out there. They're very low interest, but disaster grants really don't happen. And so that um, is something that's really hard for businesses to to um, get sort of through, you know, through their process when they are worried about having to repay the money. If they're not open right now, how are they going to be able to repay the money later? Um, and then again, back to the community lifelines. Uh, they're going to be very different in this stage as we really move through long-term recovery than they are at short-term recovery. You may see some areas starting to turn green, um, whereas some areas may still be very much in the red, especially when you're looking at economic recovery. And then we have the questions, again, from emergency managers to ask small business owners. The key question here is, can you wait this length of time? Um, one of the challenges, um, a, a nice way to say it with government programs, is they take a long time. And so even for folks to get SBA dollars, it can take a, a, a more time than they have finances around to get, um, to get up and running again. And so waiting that length of time is, is very difficult for a lot of small businesses. And that's why you see those, those really, those high closure rates. And then also for small business owners to ask emergency managers. I mean, these are really uh, the questions they're gonna be asking here are, you know, what services are available right now? What can you do in the community to help small businesses get up and running? Um, and then uh, at the end of module three, there's another break. And one important note here is to um, hand out the participant feedback forms. I know we've talked about formal and sort of informal ways of evaluating, but having a feedback form is really important and, and giving it to them at this time uh, gives them some time to fill it out as you finish the modules and really put thoughtful information back um, in your feedback so that you can look at your lessons learned and um, other helpful tips for best practices in the future. And now we'll transition into the, the last module, recovery one year later. Um, does it, I don't think I'll see any questions right now. Sarah, are there any questions at this point before we do the final module? Uh, just a question about whether this webinar link will be sent out later. And yes, it will. It, it'll be available on our website, uh, tbrpc.org slash phoenix. And then it looks like we just got another question in about the community lifelines. 
uh, I'll read it out loud, thinking about the community lifelines and industry specific issues, would it be useful to coordinate a group of small businesses who are in the same category, maybe the food industry, for example? That's a great question. And it's actually, um, you're, you're slightly ahead of, of schedule. We have a question about this later in module four, um, but happy to address it now. Absolutely. Um, if you're a small business and you're looking at prep and planning for disaster, meeting with other like-minded businesses in your industry can absolutely help you share best practices and understand what the challenges may be and how to recover. And again, one of the reasons we went back to Mexico Beach and you'll see a couple more clips from businesses there, you know, talking to businesses, whether it's in the Panhandle or the Keys or Miami, other places that have seen really devastating flooding. And, and to be honest, unfortunately, over the last five years between Hermine, Matthew, Michael and Irma, um, every county in Florida has had a natural disaster declaration. Um, and so even um, there was incredible flooding in the Daytona Beach and Jacksonville area. Obviously in Tampa, we had some flooding in um, Pinellas and Pasco counties, uh, I think with maybe three or four years ago from an, an, a storm that wasn't uh, big enough to be a hurricane, a name storm. But uh, every county has experience now um, with recent experience. Whereas before that, we've had about a, a decade of, of no named storms or no major named storms landing in Florida. So um, really turning to those experts who've lived through this um, can, can be an incredible resource for small businesses and emergency management folks on the ground in communities. And yes, if you haven't checked out the website, um, as Sarah just mentioned, there are a great number of resources. We have done um, a lot of work transitioning this from a, a live presentation into something that um, you guys can take back to your communities. And so there are so many resources available on the website. This entire webinar is being recorded and it will also be available, but we also have the PowerPoints and the um, the videos and everything in separate pieces so you can also do this as Benny mentioned um, at your own pace with your own audience and now I'll move ahead into recovery one year later um, our module four and we should have Mexico Beach, every restaurant suffered uh, either catastrophic or major damage, uh, and coming back for us has been tough. It was a, a harsh reality. I didn't really venture out far from the house, maybe a two block radius that afternoon, but got up bright and early the next morning and walked the mile down to the restaurant site and found basically a pile of what was the townhomes across the street laying where our restaurant used to be. Very few items left from our restaurant on our site. They were half mile uh, inland from here. I uh, wound up buying the, uh, the concession trailer and having it built on my own. Unfortunately, my father passed away a couple of years ago and I, I think this is where he meant for me to, to spend the money that he left me uh, to get back into business. We went down and set up a little organization called Camp Happy Tummies, and we fed 1,500 meals a day for the next six and a half weeks or so to, uh, to the people of Mexico Beach, the first responders, the survivors, the volunteers, all that. You know, I get there before daylight and there back home after our dark with a generator powering the one lamp in my refrigerator at home. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was a great feeling to know that we were doing what little bit we could to help people in town because there really wasn't a whole lot going on in that direction at that time. One pizza place did not come back. Sharon's Cafe. Two cans, the big bar and restaurant on the beach, completely gone. We never, ever had a competition-based restaurant uh, 
atmosphere in, in this town. Every single restaurant tour to a man was was there to help every other one. If you ran out of something, I got it, come get it. I don't want a person in town eating with me every meal, every week, all week long, you know? They, they need to go out and see the other people. If they like us enough to come back once or twice, bonus. But, uh, you know, the thing is you need to come to a town and experience more than just one place. Every morning at 11 when we uh, turn the open sign on and, and you see there's a line of people outside the trailer, it's like, wow, that's, that's, I mean, that, that's great. It really is. Uh, it touches me, man. It really does. Okay. Um, so as you can see, these businesses are moving through recovery, um, different businesses in different ways and different time frames. And when you look at the long term recovery, um, one year later, you know, schools have probably reopened. Some people are still having issues with insurance. Um, insurance is a, is a complicated component of recovery. And, um, you know, businesses close for good when you have an Air Force base like you guys do that. Obviously, there's one in the panhandle as well. Um, in the Panhandle, the Air Force Base was heavily damaged, and it really depends on um, what that looks like. But it's, you know, long-term response there is a federal issue, not a state issue. And so that um, complicates matters as well. One slide I wanted to draw particular attention to is this one year later recovery slide after Hurricane Michael. Um, you can see that $1.9 billion from um, federal tax dollars had been deployed in the Panhandle after Hurricane Michael one year later. Um, that includes public assistance, hazard mitigation, FEMA dollars to help people um, repair their houses, small business assistance, flood insurance. It does not include long-term recovery through community development block grant funding, which really helps people rebuild, um, rebuild their homes that have been damaged uh, for, for low-income individuals. And so right now, we're two years out from Hurricane Michael, almost and that long-term recovery funding still has not been um, deployed and so again thinking through some of the recovery options in your community um, you know there is a long wait time um, for some of these to come in you know up to two years or more and that's really disheartening to people um, on the ground when they're looking at something like Mexico Beach and they want to know how fast can things rebuild it's it's generally a you know five to ten year process and things won't ever be exactly the same but having these um, this preparation is so important to making sure that that most of your businesses can reopen in the community. I'm um, looking again at community lifelines one year later. They should be very different than they were at one day. Um, the questions that uh, emergency managers can ask small business owners. One of the important things here is what is the different survival and success rate of businesses depending on how damaged they were. What if the community around them was damaged, but their building wasn't destroyed? What if the building was destroyed? And you'll see that you know businesses have very different success rates depending on how much damage they had, along with how prepared they were and if they have a financial situation conducive to recovery, um, which is very difficult for small businesses because many of them have thin margins to begin with. Um, and then for, small, for emergency managers um, to, to talk to small business owners about what the vision is for the community. A year later, there should be a, a firm plan in place to make sure that the community can recover strongly um, on a housing situation and with economic development. Um, and you'll notice I'm going a little bit faster here. We are trying to get you guys out um, on time. And so I just want to, to go through these a little bit, but we're all available. Again, like I said, everything is available on the website and you can reach out to any one of us with any questions that you may have in the future. Um, recovery one year later for businesses really depends on their planning and resilience. And uh, I'm not gonna go over all of that right now, but um, making sure that they are prepared for continuity after a disaster is so critical. Um, for a storm of not just this magnitude, but even smaller hurricanes. Um, and then recovery tips for businesses. This is a very, very simplified version of what businesses need to do, a, a, a plan of steps for businesses to recover. But there's a resource page that we're also including on the website that will have resources to much more in depth. The state of Florida, DEO and the SBA have very in depth plans that businesses can put together online or print out and have step-by-step -step information on how they can, um, they can recover from this. 
And now I'm going to ask Sarah to play the closing video and then turn it over to Benny for the hot wash information. When your time comes and you draw the short straw on a category five storm, you need to be gone. You're gonna be exposed to considerable damage or loss. Don't let that entrepreneurial spirit be a casualty of the hurricane. My advice to every small business owner is have all your business documents somewhere that you can take with you. Have an exit plan of what you're going to do, how you're gonna shut your business down to go through the storm. Anyone in business, whether you're doing a restaurant, vacation rentals, or, or the, the boat charter captains, you have to find a way to be creative to do that. Kevin's doing sunset cruises uh, instead of charter fishing things. If you're willing to adapt and learn that, you know, post-disaster rules are different than they were before, you can make it, you know. Everybody's resilient in their own way, but you gotta, you gotta be willing to uh, adapt and change. You can download a, a loan document from the Small Business Administration now and have it so that when it's time, you fill it out and send it in. Make sure you've got plenty of insurance. Make sure you don't scamp on it. You've got to replace your business. You want to be covered. Nobody who lives in the Gulf is going to be 100% safe from it at any time ever. But if you have insurance, make sure your home is resilient in all the hurricane preparedness ways. Now I have hurricane windows as well as hurricane shutters. I have all the proper tie downs in my attic. My youngest son, the owner of the business, he found some people to patch the roof. There was about five panels missing. All the, the, the big roll-up doors were blown out. Lee took the initiative to just frame those doors in, take an old door that we had in the warehouse and just put it in there like a storefront. We just were creative and innovative and found a way to take what we had, patch it up and uh, make the best of it. One year out, there was there was a lot of hope. I mean, it was a great celebration. Everybody got together and uh, recognized, held hands, broke bread together, had drinks together. There was probably three three thousand people at this uh, this little get together. So that was very heartwarming. And I think there's plenty of uh, hope for everybody post disaster. Our regrowth has come further than I thought it would. We're just a small spot on the map. Our hearts are big. We're back up and we're, we're fighting strong. So that was another impactful video. And I can tell you X number of years ago when I retired from the military, uh, we had my retirement lunch at Killer Seafood. Uh, those are really great people. Uh, so where we are now, we've watched that video. Um, now we're at the, at the end of the exercise. Uh, we had a, a slide previous to this that talked to the hot wash, but we're actually going to talk to it. Uh, uh, in, in just a moment. So uh, you're going to conduct a hot wash. And like I said, I have a couple slides for that. And then uh, you want to collect your participant feedback forms. And then uh, you want to you want to say thank you as folks uh, as the folks leave. And you have the opportunity what sometimes encourages folks to complete those feedback forms is you give them a certificate of participation. It's something that they can put in their, their binder or however they collect that. So hot wash. 
Uh, this is what's going to feed your uh, after action report. Uh, you want to go around the room and you want to ask folks for their comments. Uh, and uh, it gives them, again, the opportunity to complete those participant feedback forms. And what are we looking for out of the hot wash? You know, if we want our evaluators and our note takers to take notes on it. We want to look for their innovative ideas. How can we change? You know, somebody uh, asked, is it okay? Can we collaborate uh, within the small business community? Certainly, you saw that with killer seafood in the restaurant business, you know, how they helped each other survive. So you want to look for those ideas. We want to look for those paths to improvement. Uh, and we want to look at the important takeaways. We want to look at what it is um, in terms of manpower, in terms of supplies, equipment, logistics change, uh, you know, training, you know, how can we do those things? Those, those are the things that are, are really important uh, when you want to, at the end, give a product out as a result of all your efforts, of all your planning efforts, even though you had the templates, you got to cheat a little bit, uh, but all your efforts at the end, you want to be able to put something out into the community to say, hey, here are the results, and this is how we're gonna move forward. So you wanna get that input from your participants that, that are in the room. So real quick, I'd, I'd ask Mike to give us a couple final thoughts before we wrap this up today. Yes, hi, uh, uh, we've already talked uh, about ownership. Let's talk about one last thing, and that is targeting uh, the audience. During Aaron's, uh, presentation she she talked about uh, uh, groups of of uh, restaurants and other businesses you know this is the is the uh, is the uh, is the is the is the ideal time to begin working with them to develop a plan for not only their individual uh, uh, business but for like uh, uh, businesses. So uh, you want to really work at, at at identifying who those people are and uh, focus on on uh, them. And with that, I want to turn it back over to uh, Sarah Vitale, who uh, has done a great job. So uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So I want to thank our presenters. Uh, thank you very much, Benny, Mike, and Aaron, for your presentation and for your exp expertise. And I know that we just uh, gave you all a lot of information. So I, if, you, if you needed some time to digest this, uh, we are available via email uh, to answer any questions that you might think of um, later down the road when you're picking these materials up. If you have any questions, please. Uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out to us. We have just a, a few minutes, so if there are any last, uh, last minute questions you want to throw into the chat box, we're here to take them. But I want to remind you all that uh, uh, you, you can download these materials on our website, and we hope that you do. We hope that you uh, go through them and, and read through them. And again, I'd like to thank our stakeholder committee for their involvement throughout this project. And thank you, all of you, for attending this webinar and for your attention today. We did get a question. Videos are inspiring, will be meaningful to small businesses. Uh, thank you, whoever wrote that. We, we appreciate that and agree. So uh, this concludes our webinar. I don't think I see any more questions. Uh, appreciate all of your participation and your attention this morning. And we'll talk to you soon. Hope everyone has a great day.